you served in which war? I served in World War II in the 99th Evacuation Hospital in the Army. And what was your highest rank? Highest rank was Tech Sergeant. And which general location, in which general location did you serve? I served in these, from New Guinea to Japan. New Guinea through the uh, uh, Celebes Islands, the Philippine Islands, and then into Japan, the Yokohama, in that area. Okay. Um, and were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. I tried to enlist and my eyesight wasn't good enough, but whenever they got me in the draft, they found out it was good enough. <laughs> okay. Well, where did, why don't you tell me where you did your basic training? And did my basic training in Shelby, Mississippi, Camp Shelby. And then from there we went to the California central area where they were training the uh, troops for the uh, uh, African c campaign. And, and uh, then when we finished there, we went over out to the coast in, in California and sailed from there, sailed there from uh, where San Francisco. Okay. And where did you sail? To where did you sail? New Guinea. 31 days. Uh, do you remember the ship you were on? Yes, the... Uh, I should have carried it over here. The Holbrook. The Holbrook? General Holbrook. All right. And why don't you just tell your story from there? When you got to New Guinea, what did you... What were your duties and... We, when we got to New, Guinea's, to New Guinea, we, they had just taken Hollandia. So we set up in Hollandia uh, and, and put our tents up on the beach. We didn't do any actual evacuation hospital work at that point. But uh, from that point, uh, the colonel had me uh, take a, a four-wheel drive, four-wheel unit of whole blood, uh, going in with the 34th Division into Mor into uh, Moratai. They were going to build a big va ba air base in Moratai so that they could go in there and have more flights going into the uh, Philippine Islands so that we could get into the Philippine Islands that much faster. <clears throat> so he, he had me take that in on D-Day in Moratai, but thank the Lord the D-Day was a very quiet one. The Japanese had no idea we were going into Moratai. They figured we were going to go into uh, Halmahara because we had done all the bombing on Halmahara. And uh, so it was very nice. If you're going to go in on a D-Day, you might as well go in on one when they don't do much shooting at you. And then from that point on, in, in Moratai, what we did was they, they had a big air fleet there B-24s, B-17s, 20s, and 25s, and uh, they were very busy hitting the Philippine Islands and Borneo. It was a long flight from Borneo to the, to the back to the air base again, and that was the rough, the rough part of it, that uh, uh, if somebody got shot in, over Borneo, it was a long time, seven hours, before they got the back to us where we could take care of them, which made it pretty rough. And, uh, and then, of course, as, as always happens at the big air bases like that, you can hear the uh, planes warming up, waiting to make sure that everything is all set for them to go, and then they start down the runway. And you hope that you never hear the stop at the end when they hit at the, at the end and break down and go into flames and all the machine gun mis bullets and the bombs go off and the patients are dead. And then we also took care of the, th I think it was the 34th Division, <clears> that was still cleaning up the, the Japanese that were still in the uh, center of Moratai. And uh, so we used to get those guys too. And uh, then from there we went to Mindanao and uh, the, they were, the Japanese were finally moving out of the Philippine Islands. And, uh, and we, we followed up the troops that were going in back of the Japanese and pushing them out. So we were right in back of them. In fact, 
to make sure we had enough people with us. We had a bunch of Filipino guerrillas that were paid for by the United States government going along with us. And uh, so we, st we, didn't, we didn't set up to do much because it was, it was, we were moving too fast, really, in through there. We finally came to an area that they called, that was where they, were, they, were, they called it the Merrimag Airstrip. And what we did when we got there, we managed to bunch up, and the colonel made arrangements for uh, uh, little Piper Cubs to fly some of us up ahead uh, to the airstrip and see what it looked like and whether it would be a good place for us to set up so that we could stay in that area because it was up in the thickness of the Philippine Islands at that point. And uh, so we did that, and uh, then we did set up there, and we set up there, and when we moved into Mindanao for that particular operation, they sent us a bulletin from Army headquarters saying that uh, the only neuro neurological uh, doctor, the brain's only brain surgeon that they had was on in our bunch. They told us that the only neurosurgeon on the island was going to be Dr. Evan Alexander, Captain Alexander that was in our outfit. And uh, so I asked him uh, who he would like to work with uh, in the unit. And he said, well, there weren't any doctors in the unit that were trained in brain surgeons. So he said, you can do it. And I said, fine. So I was assistant brain surgeon. <laughs> and then uh, it was horrible because uh, you, that's, you the, the, I think the most advice I could give every, anybody is, for God's sakes, don't get shot in the head, because it really is tough. So then when we, got, when we get, did get set up in that area, uh, we took care of the uh, troops, at the, and, and the, the Japanese finally decided that uh, they were, they were, they were going to head out. So while they were heading out, we went up to Panay, and... Uh, went all through our unit to see what we needed to take in because we, at that point, there was no talk of surrender. Japan didn't want to surrender. So we were going to have to go in. We were scheduled for D-Day at Yokohama. And so we started working on that, but I brought along a nice case of infectious hepatitis with me from Mindanao. So I spent about 21 days in a uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in the Philippine Islands, and we did get a chance to see uh, uh, Jerry. Uh, oh. oh, God, the guy that did all has done all the wonderful things for children with with cancer. Uh, he put on a show for us, and that was great. It was. Uh, Oh, Godfrey. Well, I'm sure you'll have, everybody will know about it when they if when they hear about it. Jerry Lewis? Huh? Jerry Lewis? No. no. Jerry? That's okay. Yeah. Danny Thomas was Danny Thomas, and he was terrific. And in fact, the building that they had us quartered in at the St. Vincent's Hospital was a, a, a metal roof, big building that they had filled with all of us, with the, with the yellow urine and the yellow faces. And, and they filled it, the, the, what they treated us with was hard candies, a uh, lot of them, a, apple juice and, and little, uh, fruit juices. And then we eventually, most of us, uh, managed to come through with it. And then Japan surrendered. So we uh, headed into Yokohama, and we got there in time to see the, the Japanese sign the papers. And that was very interesting. And then we, they moved us by truck into Yokohama, and then they brought us into a, ne the next city to it. They took away our guns. Because the medical outfits are not supposed to be armed. But we were armed. We all had carbines. But they took them away from us. And they moved us by truck to the city of Yutsunomiya, 
which is a city of about a million, just down below Yokohama. And they moved us into the barracks that night in the back door with no guns whatsoever. And the Japanese soldiers were going out the front doors with their rifles over their shoulders. And you know, it kind of felt me, you wanted a little bit, well, they were shooting at us just not a couple of days of before that. But we, they, they were all right. And they came, and a bunch of the officials of, of the city of Yutsunomiya came up to welcome us in and say everything was going to be fine and be sure to take advantage of the shopping stores they had down there were there. And they also said, that if any one of our men would like to go down to some of their comfort stations, they were welcome to go there and they would not have to pay for it. But I don't think there was any of our guys went down to those comfort stations because they knew that those women were all slaves of conquered nations. So the next morning, we went down into, some of us went down into town and met the people down there, and they all said Ohio to us and bowed, and we said the same to them. And uh, then we had heard about a place called Nico that was near there, and they said that it, they had some wonderful missionaries, not uh, missionaries, but wonderful uh, places of walking around, religious places down there. And, and it was also beautiful. It was a beautiful mountain area, so we got one of our trucks to get down there, and a bunch of us got in the truck, and we went down to to the place down in Nikko. And we're driving along the road, and, the, and Japan was very similar to Connecticut. The hills and, and, and good highways and things like that, and nice farms along the road. And we're going along the road, and we had noticed that there was a sandy paved place on the right-hand side as we got, went along blacktop roads, and uh, and uh, there was a gutter along that ran along with it. And all of a sudden, our driver stopped on the road. We said, what are you stopping for? And he said, look. And it was a, Chinese, a Japanese lady coming toward us, and she had just stopped and walked over to the little gutter and lifted up her skirt and squatted down and urinated in the, st in the stream. So we figured, well, if that's what the Japanese have that there for, but a little bit further along, we had a pee call, and we all got out and lined up along it and peed it. We also saw a Japanese farmer at the hotel, at one of the hotels on the way, and he had a big truck, old truck with horse-drawn vehicle, and he had great big containers in the back. And what he was doing was he was buying the fecal material from the hotel, and they put it into those containers. And then we saw afterward, we saw another truck, and we saw where they were taking it to their, the bar, their farmyard or their vegetable garden, and they were ladling it out in little dribbles from the uh, containers and putting it around the, the uh, plants. We, so we did, buy, we did eat in the, in the hotel that was there, and it was uh, kind of unique because it was getting pretty cold at that time, and they were heating that hotel with a little charcoal burners in the place. So we ate the food, but we didn't take anything that wasn't cooked. And then we headed for home, and on our way, they, we got a notice from the Army that they were substituting a regimental combat team uh, instead of us. We weren't going to be holding, we weren't going to be operating on holding the thing up, or we weren't going to be setting up our unit for anything. And uh, so they said that they had a rule with a regimental combat team that if any of them went out and did outside the, their area, their barracks, they had to have five men, and one of them had to carry a BAR, Browning, Browning Automatic Rifle. So we were kind of pretty brave to get on there and do it, and we kind of brave or stupid, I don't know which. But we were pretty sure that they were going to do what their their hero hero told them to do. And when we got back there, back there, I found out that because I had fifty points, they didn't want to pay, keep on paying me any money, so they shipped me the hell out of the outfit down to Zappa Zama, where they were where they were doing it as a repo depot, and uh, I came home on the. Uh, 
I forgot what that did. Let's see if I can find it. Well, I came home on a, a, a troop ship loaded with people. In fact, it was loaded with a whole division, and they didn't need me, and they had enough stuff to keep them busy talking to each other. So it was a kind of a lonely trip, and it was a rough trip, and it was 17 days on the water, and the waves were terrific in the North Pacific. And we got into, we were going to go up into uh, Washington, but they had so much snow up in there, and they had so much snow up in the upper part of the United States that uh, we went down and got, got on to uh, San Francisco again and headed for home up to, through the Canadian railroads. That's it. Okay, let's just back up. Um, you were living in Bristol when you were um, yeah. When you were drafted. Yeah. Do you recall the date that you were drafted? Yeah. What, what year? Yeah, it was, uh, well, I can tell you the date that we left, huh? Okay. But on November 7th, 1942, we left Bristol and went up to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and then ship from there down to uh, uh, the Mississippi. Yeah. And, and from Mississippi, you went to California. Yeah. Exactly. Do you have a town in California? In June, oh. June. We went to the... Oh, June, okay. So that would be June 43. Yeah. Okay, the California Desert Training Center. It was in right above, right above Needles. Mm -hmm. And from there, that what was your training there? That was that's where we had that's where we started the learning. What we were really for, we learned everything by by word of mouth from our doctors that were our teachers, and then we went through the complete uh, infantry training. We went through the machine gun firing over your head. And, and the uh, gas mass and going 50 feet up in the air and then have to climb over the railing and go down on the nets. You know, we, was, uh, we really got the, uh, the hell of a good training. <laughs> and how long did that last? Uh, that was till December, did you say? No. We went out there in June and, and we left there in this September. September... Oh, we, we, we left there uh, on Ju in July, the day that the uh, in the company of army was going into uh, the France. June that was June sixth, was it? Nineteen forty three. Forty four. Forty four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that was July forty four, and. Um we had nurses training, surgical nurses, well, they were all in the Army, and they were good, and they knew what they were doing, and they were excellent teachers. And uh, we got no tell you, know, we scrubbed up and worked with the doctors, either as an assistant doctor or as a, a, surgeon, a nurse, handing them the instruments. It all depended how busy we were. And so we learned, we learned everything. Uh, and your... Your rank coming out of uh, basic training was what? Uh, staff sergeant. Out of out of base, not out of basic training. When you finished basic training, you were PFC. No, no, I, 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 we were. I was a, a staff sergeant by the when we were in the down in the California. Okay. In fact. And at, at that point, the reason I was a staff sergeant at that point was because uh, the doctor that was in charge of, the, of our surgical section, uh, do, do, do we had a, a, what's the word I'm trying to think, a cadre that, that, that set and started the thing originally. And there was a staff sergeant in there that was going to be in, the, in charge of the surgical section. 
and when we we're headed out, we we're heading out to California to really get it set up. That the our section set up. The captain said to me, "You would you have any trouble giving uh, what's his name orders?" And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Because I'd rather have you have char- be in charge of it." <laughs> I said, "Don't worry about it." I said. So I, he said, well, then that's it, because he said, uh, yeah, I know you've got to have a lot better knowledge and you're better at handling the guys are than he is. And uh, when, when you were in uh, Mindanao, um, what were your, like, a daily duty? What would be a typical day? I kept, I, had, I wrote up all the information on everything we did that particular day in the book that we had the great big book, and that was left in Japan. And uh, then, and then to sign the guys what we were going to do. It, we, it was, you know, we had to wait and see what was going to be there. We could, you know, we get up in the morning and we could find a bunch of guys lying out there in our area waiting to be taken care of because they were just been brought in by the uh, clearing companies and stuff like that. And then it all depended. Then we'd start on cleaning those guys up you know, we didn't have any running water. You did it with with pitchers and uh, boiled water pitchers and, and doing it on cots and cleaning the guys up and stopping the bleeding and all that stuff and then getting them ready to put them, then putting them on the operating tables so the doctors could start operating on them. And then we would either be still taking care of the other ones that are coming in or we'd be probably working with the doctors. Or with the, the patients that had yeah. wounded and were recovered. Yeah. See, we, we never kept people that long, the, in, the injured. Uh, and I think that's the reason that we were able to do what we did. We didn't realize, and I, I didn't realize this until after the war was over, <clears throat> and then, because we we worked on the the patients, we didn't see them the next day most of the time because we were busy, uh, and the, the our ward men were taking care of them, and uh, so we didn't see them. We didn't know, and uh, so after after the war was over, uh, it was the problem. Maybe it was a couple of years after. I all of a sudden I could feel something down in here, and I knew what it was. I knew it was a hernia. So I went down to the surgeon, and I said, hey, I got a hernia I need taken care of. And he said, you sure? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, let me make sure. So he checked, and he said, well, yeah, yeah, right, you got a hernia. And he said, okay. And he handed me a book, and I said, what the hell is this for? And he said, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to take care of the hernia. And I said, no, you're not. I said, you're not going to sit there looking at a television screen while you're working on me. And he said, well, that's what we're doing now. And I said, I don't give a shit what you're doing now. I said, I, I've, I know what's down in there. I said, I want you to go right across like this, and I want you looking in there what you're doing. When you put that support in there, I want you to know that it's going to be in the right place. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. So he did. And when I woke up in the, in the hospital and I looked down there at that line of staples, and felt the pain of it. Three, then a couple of years later, I had another one on the right, on the left side, and I went down and said, "I got another hernia." And he said, "Oh, okay, don't worry about that. Well, I'll do the same thing I did the last time." I said, "You will like hell." I said, "You'll do the way you want to do it." <laughs> this was after the war. That was after the war. Yeah. Um, when you got home, um, what did you do after the war? I went right back into my old job because uh, the, when, I, when I was on furlough, I was an office manager for an automobile dealership. And uh, when, I was, when I would come home on furlough, I had three furloughs from California. And when I came home, there was a 98 Oldsmobile full of gas for me to ride around in while I was there. Nice, huh? And when I came home from from Devons, the boss and his wife were waiting for me in Hartford. 
with an 98 Oldsmobile to use until I decided what I wanted to do. Well, you can bet your ass I went back to my job. Yeah. What was the uh, What was the company? What was it, it was Ed was Edward Auto Sales, and it was yes, Oldsmobile dealership in Bristol. What kind of food did you have when you were uh, when you were over there? We had good food. Uh, they got a lot. They used to get a lot of it from Australia, like we had horse meat that was from Australia, and it was delicious. And uh, it was it was fine all the way through. We can't, I can't complain at all. We ate well. The only thing is, we, we, after after we start, started forming. And we and we started. We we worked for a while, and then they brought in a bunch of guys from uh, uh, one of the, one of the camps in New York, oh area in New York, and they were good. And they moved in, and we started going back again, and started all over again. And then they moved in a, a couple of hundred guys from the southern states, and then we had to start all over again. But the, most a lot of those guys went into the uh, cooking, and. Uh, they all used so goddamn much the, 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 the spices. And we all thought we had hemorrhoids or something. Our our behind our behinds kept burning. And you know, and then we went into the islands where those little berries grew on the bushes. Those guys were out there picking those things all the time and putting them in little glass jars with water in them. And they eat those salt things all the time they were uh, cooking. Or when they were eating too. Did you did you get any uh, any medals or citations while you were over there? Yeah, we did. We got we we got the we got the presidential unit citation for the Moratai campaign. We got the presidential unit citation for the Mindanao campaign. We got the Philippines presidential unit citation medals for both the Moratai and the Mindanao campaigns. And there were a bunch of us got bronze star medals. Did you? Yeah. That's, that's very good. Congratulations. Hmm. Uh, were you married at the time you were? No, I was going with my wife. With Millie. Yeah. And did you uh, take any leave while you were in Japan? I did. They got to help me at home quick. They didn't want to pay my salary any longer. I would have liked to stay. I would have loved to stay and come home with my outfit. Because we were very close. You know, because well, you can see pictures of the guys I had. My outfit was, I had that. I took 24 guys, I think, that were un under me. And uh, they were nice guys. Most of, them, most of them were from New York or New England. And there was a couple that were from the South, but they were nice guys, too. Uh, they were, it wasn't like an outfit, and I was in charge of it. We were all working together. That we were a nice bunch of guys, that's really and truly. That's the best way. Yeah. Uh, you know, did you join any uh, veterans organizations after you got home? Yeah, American Le the uh, Le Legion. Yeah, yeah, and the uh, veterans of foreign wars too. And we all we also joined the we started a Catholic War Veterans when I came home too in our church, but with that we didn't stay there too long. We went into the Legion. What was your homecoming like? Good. I, I got home at night on the tw I think it was on the twenty fifth of December. No, it wasn't the twenty that'd be for Christmas. I got home just a couple of days before Christmas. In 1945. Yeah. And, and uh, 
the buddies that I went in with, they had gotten home. They were, we didn't, I didn't lose any buddies that I, you know, that I chummed around with before. And they were home at our house and my house. And we had a, it was wonderful. Real nice. Do you, do you feel like you've had any uh, post-traumatic stress? Yeah. Uh, uh, afterward, I really felt that I felt sick a lot. I I I couldn't even I couldn't even hardly walk up the cellar stairs after putting stuff in the fire in the furnace. Uh, I I was concerned that I was gonna I was di gonna die. I went to my my wife. She was out shoveling the driveway because she didn't she was worried about me doing it, and. Uh, I went to doctors. I went to about five doctors in town, and they all gave me different things that they said was wrong with me. And uh, and then I figured that this is why the last one I went to said he would suggested having my sinuses all drained. And uh, my aunt, who was a nurse, said, "Don't you dare get it. Do it. That's tell you that's terrible." Uh, she said, "Go to the." The uh, outfit up in Boston, the uh, can't remember the name. The clinic up there. Well, they had all doctors and everything, but I can't remember the name. And uh, so I did. I went up there, and and they checked me all over. I spent two days up there, and they checked everything. Well, I whenever the doctor told me that I was going to, I needed to get my sinuses drained. I started having headaches. And then uh, I that I went up there with a the, with a headache that day, and then the last doctor that checked me over uh, did my sinuses, and he said, "You don't have any sinus problems," and my headache went away. And they finally said to me, "You know, there's not a damn thing wrong with you. You're in perfect physical condition." I said, "Why the hell am I doing this?" And they said, "It's because for three years you had somebody telling you what to do." And they said, "Now all of a sudden, you're you're you got a, you're raising a family and everything, and now you got it." And I said, "Yeah, but I had it then too." And they said, "That's all right. It was different. It was completely different." And they gave me a bottle, a little bottle of stuff like that to take a couple of spoonfuls, and I really know it was a, to slow me down a little bit, and. Uh, well, I'm 94. <laughs> Did you see any other USO shows besides Danny Thomas? Yes, we went to uh, one in New Guinea. And uh, it was... It was a centennial airstrip on New Guinea. Bob Hope, Jerry Colonna, and Francis Langford. Yeah, on this, and it was a New Guinea. It was a, the airstrip on New Guinea, the centennial airstrip, and. Uh, the, 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 we had to go quite a ways to get to it, way back in the, into the mountains there. Because let's face it, the Japanese had been in New Guinea for 10 years, and they built up a lot of stuff in there to, for us to get shot at by them when they were in all the places they built. And uh, But they, they, they had, they, it was a, a good show. They, you know, they were, they were two, Bob, Bob Hope and Kelowna were great, and Francis Langford was terrific. And uh, they said, okay, we're going to turn out the lights here. We want everybody that's here to either light, turn, light their cigarette lighter or light a match. 
And we did an honest to God, you wouldn't believe the number of guys that were there. You know, all over you, because it's pitch black. Yeah, unbelievable. So we, we had that one, and we had uh, Danny Thomas in the New Guinea, or in the Philippine Islands, Panay. That's the only, oh, there was one other one. There was a, 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 a woman. I don't remember who she was. It wasn't something that we. Re it wasn't something like uh, Frances Langford. You know, she 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 put on a like a Shakespearean uh, recital or something. But Frances Langford was good. In fact, she married a guy that was in the lumber business or, or no Evanrood business, and. Uh, and they, they had, I used to listen to their pro, her program afterward, and uh, they had a pro thing, you wrote in, told her what she liked about, I forgot what the hell it was, but I wrote in a total all about her. And I got a beautiful outboard. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful outboard motor, but what the hell, at that time we had just gotten it, we were, but we bought a house and so I sold the outboard motor to a guy, and I got a rug for the living room floor. <laughs> did, did you do you recall any funny experiences? Any any unusual funny things that happened? Uh, like yeah. <clears throat> I read it to you. When we got in the when we got in when we landed in, in New Guinea. Uh, we just we just set up on the beach because uh, we weren't going to take any. We had to wait and get that Moratai thing settled first, and uh, uh, so all by let's see. We, uh, okay, at the, we landed at the bottom end of New Guinea, where we dumped off all the other troops at Finchhaven docks, and then we went up to Hollandia, where we went down landing nets. And the aquatic ducks took us to the beach. As soon as we hit the beach, we had a real gully washer. So we all stripped, rolled up our clothes so they wouldn't get too wet, and soaked up for a nice shower. We set up a mishmash of tents on that beautiful beach and big quartermaster boxes, latrines, great big ones. And uh, they had this, what, I think six, six holes or, or seven holes and one that had the netting for the flies to get up into. They used to clean them out each morning and then pour gasoline down in holes and touch it off to burn out the crap. One morning, one of our cooks was slow getting off and the flame filtered through the sand from one box to the other and gave him two lifted him up in the air and gave him two tremendous pendulous blisters where normal cheeks had been. I don't think he ever grew back any hair. And then, you know, actually, God, I never in my life saw you. What the hell? Here, now we're, here, now we're, you you get problems like that. I don't think the doctors knew what the hell to do with it. You know, because the poor little son of a gun, he, that thing really, really, God, they were, honest to God, they were hanging down like great big balloons. They finally had. They finally decided they had to unpuncture them and get the air out of them, and then they plastered them up with get Vaseline bandages and God, unreal. That was that was one thing that was funny. I remember another time too. They had they were doctors were working and it was when we were in Moratai, I think, and the doctors were working on they had uh, the doctors working on a guy and uh, all of a sudden. The, 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 they had to do up. I guess I think he had reported because his uh, 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 foreskin had locked on, gotten down there and locked on there, and it was a problem. So they were going to they were going to do a circumcision on him, and uh, they got started on it. And all of a sudden, I happened to come into the tent to see how they were doing, and they said, "Hey, will you get a hold of Doctor Kyoto?" And I said, "Yeah, why?" 
They said, well, we get, this guy here has got an erection, and we don't know how the hell to stop it. So I said, okay. So I went out looking for Dr. Kyoto. I went up in the section up there and up to Dr. Kyoto, and he said, cool, they got that? And I said, yeah, and he said, Christ, I can't come down. He said, I got the freaking Hungarian crud here. This day. He said, I'll be, I'll be down there shitting into the into these clean areas. And he said, get a hold of, of Major, I forgot, I can't remember his name now, and see if he can do it. So I went looking for him, and I said, they, they, they got a problem down there. I said, they got a guy that's got an erection, and they don't know what the hell to do with it. And uh, and uh, I said, Dr. Kyoto's got diarrhea, so he can't come down. Can you come? And he said, oh, yeah, I'll go down there. And we started walking down together, and then he said, I don't have any idea what to do. I said, God, you're going to be a great help, aren't you? <laughs> he was an, an older doctor. He, he was a nice, real nice guy, lovable man. Remember his name? Yeah. Dr. Corcus. And he was a really, real good guy. He told me one time, I was operating with him, uh, working with him on a case. He and I were doing the whole thing because they were short of doctors at that time. And uh, he said, you know, uh, you, and when we were down in, in uh, California working on the, 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 the troops that were down there, uh, we, got, we had a lot of cases of uh, appendicitis, and I don't think all of them were appendicitis. I think a lot of them were the fact that the guys drank a lot of cold liquid and, and it was he, heated and everything. Because some of those appendixes didn't look that bad. But I remember he and I were working together on one. We were talking, and I, and I said, he, he had done a, a McBurney incision, and it was, so he was working, he, 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 you, you work inside that way and just stretching a little bit. And uh, I said, he, uh, he said, you know, I said, is there anything, could you, any, could you do it with this with less or something like that? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, I, I can bet, I bet you I can do an appendicitis operation with a scalpel and one hemostat. And I said, oh, come on. He said, yeah, honest to God. He said, the next case I get, I'll Give you a call, and I'll do it. And all of a sudden, we got a case of appendicitis when he was on. And I said, this is the time, isn't it? And he said, no. I said, why not? He said, because this guy's got appendix and not, not in the right place. I said, you got to be kidding. You're, you're using it as an excuse. He said, no, I'm not. He said, this appendix is not going to be anywhere near. And it wasn't. It was way the hell over. So I, I never saw the, him do the operation. But I knew we had a guy that got shot in the leg, a very bad shot in the leg. You know, I don't remember. The only one I can remember that was that we took one leg, that leg, the guy lost his leg. You know, you when you saw the pictures in the Civil War, everybody that, had, that got shot in the leg lost it. We never, we saved a hell of a lot of legs. Those guys would, our, our doctors would splice the artery, the femoral artery together. And in this case here, the guy had so much damage, it was horrible. And he, he said, God, I, I said, I'm, I'm, I got to save this guy's leg. And he kept working on it and working on it. And he, he, he reused extra uh, arteries from other places and did it and everything. And then we had to get in touch with one of the base hospitals to get heparin because we didn't have anything like that to keep the, we were using warfarin at that time, I think. And uh, to keep the, the blood circulating. And uh, he did, he tried that, he tried the hardest to do that. And the guy finally had so much agony because all of a sudden ga gas gangrene, gangrene set in. And he had to operate. And the, the damn thing is, uh, I, I was getting the guy ready for the operation. I was shaving his leg. And when we shaved around cuts, we didn't use razors. We used, we'd take a straight razor blade and put it in a hemostat and go with that. You use it like a safety, like a straight razor. And uh, so I was doing that and I did, I nicked the place there and the, Guys bleeding there, and 
And whenever we go in there, the car just looked at me and he said, oh, thanks a lot. And I said, for what? And he said, you're marking off here where I'm supposed to do the cutting, aren't I? I said, yeah, I did. <laughs> he said, okay, that's where I'm going to cut them anyhow. That was Dr. Cusker? Cor Corcus, K-O-R-K-O-S, I think it was. In, in general, did you feel you were working with the high-quality men? Oh, the, every one of our men were absolutely wonderful. Really, they were. They were, they were great to work with. Like uh, Dr. the one that uh, was a brain surgeon. Uh, he and I corresponded after the war was over. That's nice. Yep. Until he died. He died in 92. Yeah. And uh, we did it. They, 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 were, they were terrific. They were terrific. Uh, when you got home, did you go back to college, or, or did you go to college? After? No, I went to a secretarial school before I went in the service, and and that's I learned the General Motors accounting system that they use for their dealers, and that's how I got the job with the the, the Oldsmobile dealer in town. And if you know, if. If, I, if they'd had what they have now, the physician's assistants, that would have been wonderful. Because let's face it, I knew so much about it and, and did so much. You know, I could tie knots with one hand. You know, when, when we were working in the brain case, he'd say, you know, tie that one off, will you? You know, and uh, I'd go there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it I, I would have, I, because I, I really loved it. I, I, I enjoyed what I was doing. It's too bad you couldn't have continued. Yeah, but I, I wanted to get married, too. What the hell, Billy, you know, we'd gone together for six years. and Probably would have made a great doctor. Yeah, I might have. <laughs> yeah. But I would have been, the thing is, I was 24, was it 24? What did yeah, twenty four when I got out, and and I figured, and then I'd have to go to college, I'd have to go to college, and I would have been, you know, I I couldn't have supported a family and done that. Have you ever had any reunions that you've been to? No, never did. One night, I got a call from a one of the guys in our outfit, in our outfit, and. Uh, he called me, and he was completely smashed. And uh, he said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to get together. Said, well, what the hell? I got, I got Billy had just had a miscarriage. and No, we never got together. Never did. And the, in fact, the, about the four or five guys that I wrote to after the war was over, they all died. One guy had a brain uh, uh, tumor that burst on him. Uh, and uh, another one had a heart attack, put and changing his tire on the road to Florida. He was going; they were going down for the winter. He and his wife, and uh, another one had uh, cancer. Yeah. Do you remember their names? I got yeah, some uh, somewhere. Yeah, well, I one was the name was. Isn't that horrible? That's the thing that I that that's it's gone. I I can't remember names. I can't remember names that I'm going visiting now when I, you know, go down and sit down and shoot the shit with them for uh, hours. Well, is there is there anything that uh, you don't think we covered that we should have in this interview? Yeah, that, that really and truly, you know. I can't, I, I, and it's funny to say this, I enjoyed my three years. Okay. Now that seems weird, but. No. I, you did a good service. Yeah. And I'd like to thank you for it. <laughs>